we are live at Reclaim Today, and I am joined today not only by Jim Groom, but also by Andy Rush at University of North Florida. What, what is Whoa. that? Whoa. Wow. Hey. Man. The, Good morning, the, everybody. The As man, the friendly new media guy. <laughs> the man makes an entrance. You can't argue with that for sure. That's awesome. <laughs> I, you doing, I expect no less. I'm good. I'm good. I expect no less of, of myself when I'm in your presence. So, <laughs> And this is just like old times, you know, getting together with the DTLT crew. That's right. That's awesome. So, like, I mean, Tim and I have some, you know, very uh, selfish reasons for having you on our show today. <laughs> uh, but I also just wanted to, in, in, in addition to looking at Tim, I wanted to actually ask you, like, is this a new day for the new media, you know, guy or gal on campus? Like in COVID, my personal experience has been going back not only to the radio, but Tim and I have been experimenting a lot with TV, live broadcasting, all sorts of video stuff that brings us back to the kit and all the stuff we did at DTLT. So right. what has your experience been being a new media specialist? We didn't even introduce you at the University of Northern Florida. What's it like? <laughs> so I'm my official title is course media developer, um, but essentially what that means in the COVID area is everything going online, and especially video and audio, um, podcasting. It's all coming kind of to a head because everybody needs to put media online quickly. <laughs> so I have been deployed in such a way that has been kind of a madhouse. Um, and then in addition to that, kind of describing what I'm doing, describing what I do, telling people how to optimize things with microphones and cameras and lighting. Um, and so I come to you in my studio because of, of COVID, because it's, it's completely changed the game in terms of what we have to do and what we've been tasked to do. Um, this is a studio that's been in existence really since, or some form since I've been here, which actually coming up September 14th will be five years that I've been at UNF, which is, mind blowing in itself. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's it's totally crazy. Um and did but, you play a so role we, in building that studio? Or yeah, was so that when already I first, there when you got there? When I first came here, there was we have two buildings that CERT, the Center for uh Instruction and Research Technology here at mm -hmm. the University of North Florida. So there's two there was CERT East and CERT West. I was over in CERT West and we had a studio with a green painted wall um and you know some nice cameras and some lights. And we were set up there to do some basic green screen stuff if people wanted to incorporate that into their into their media. So that was one of my charges. Um, <clears throat> we were starting, I was bringing some of the domain of one's own stuff. And we certainly can talk about, you know, reclaim and de domain of one's own and where that fits in. But, and that, you know, that becomes a part when it comes to media and presenting media. But, so we had a studio in the other building and I, my office, office was right across from the studio. It was just in the hallway, right across the, the hallway. And so I'm part of the CERT creative team, but the rest of the CERT creative team was over in the East building um, or CERT East. And so I eventually moved from there over to here. And then I was going back and forth between the studio and we said, let's bring the studio into, into the CERT East building. And so that's the space that I'm in right now. Um, and so we've just, I've tweaked it all along. We purchased some camera equipment to kind of upgrade and go to 4K, which I don't think will ever really come anytime soon. Um, but we are now in this space. And then when the COVID hit, um, you know, back in March, it was like, okay, now what do we do? Um, I don't think I'll get any business. You know, nobody's going to want to come to the studio. Um, and then we thought, well, we could make the studio safe. And that's kind of what what we're doing here now is a combination of things. So, and then it's, it, we're also going to kind of incorporate the one button studio idea that Penn state started back in 2012. I think it was, um, where you yeah, come in gonna, and you hit a button. That's what I was going to ask was like, are you thinking of any self-service type options like that? In addition to, I, I guess you could do it safely with somebody doing the production side, which would do one thing, but then could you do self-service stuff too? 
Yeah, so I'm I'm really having a tough time with the one button mm -hmm. kind of idea. I mean, there's one button that you hit to record, and that was kind of the the model that we had in the online learning lab, which is another space over on the on the west side. Um, <clears throat> and you would come in with your flash drive, you would get your cameras set up, and then you would hit the record button. You'd have a, a lapel mic to wear, and you'd make your recording. And you could write on a on a um, a touch board kind of screen, and you could incorporate some different things, but the quality wasn't great. Um, and it was a very complicated system. It reminded me of every, you know, classroom kiosk that is over engineered. Um, and so we decided to kind of bring some of that stuff and make it, make it more simple. Um, well, and, and, so, and I imagine it starts <laughs> to get a little bit factory wise like i mean the videos that you produce out of something like that are by their very nature i imagine going to be sort of cookie cutter right i mean there's only so much you can do in that sort of frame to make it automated right right and you know the even the videos that we did over here in the studio with the green screen and the professional cameras they were kind of it's like well you have to shoot in front of the green wall um, and here's your selection of backgrounds and here's some lower thirds that we can put up. And I think, I think they function very well. We have a lot of faculty members who go through an online training course um, through our instructional designers. Um, and then they come to me to do like their course introduction video, which will get placed in their Canvas course. Um, in some cases, they might put, the, put it on a website, but generally it's, you know, Canvas is the delivery mechanism for a lot of what we do. When I first got here, we went through the transition of going from Blackboard to Canvas. So um, I, I keep reliving Groundhog Day over and over again as, you know, as my, so my next job, I'm sure I'll go to a school that's still using Blackboard and then we'll transition to something more reasonable. Um, but yeah, that's right. kind of been the evolution of, of me being here at UNF. Um, uh, but right now it's, it's, I'm in that pig and slop kind of, uh, scenario where I get to spec equipment and bring it all in and use it and, and play and, you know, in some cases amaze people, um, with what you can do. And that's, and that's the whole purpose of this, of this new studio. So, you know, whether we want to call it the multi-button studio or the multi-function studio or just the studio, um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun and, and I've, I've got some things to show you. So, um, you know, we can, we can get to that after you pummel me with more questions or, you know, get this, get this stuff out of the way. You know? I do. I have one question for you, Andy. Um, yeah. One of the things I was, you know, and this is new for us is one of the things we've been playing with just last week and we're using right now is this thing StreamYard. Have you explored like any online, somewhat in the middle production kind of uh, like whether it's with Zoom, whether with a tool like this where you do deal with some faculty and help them produce something, but not in the studio online, or is that just too difficult given they have to have the green screen, the camera and everything else? Yeah, so as much as I've worked hard on getting the perfect key from my green screen, I, you know, you quickly realize how limiting it, it, it can still be. Um, you can only do so much with backgrounds. It, 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 you have to work hard to get it to look decent. Um, and then when it comes down to it, yeah, nobody at home has green screens. There's the, you know, there's the portable ones that you can roll up and, and put behind you. Um, but no, I, I don't want to, I don't want faculty to even worry about keying. Um, it, I want them to worry about good lighting, you know? Um, I want them to to think then about their audio. And those two things are the most important. You know, don't worry about your camera. Don't worry about uh, too much else. But lighting and, and audio are the most important things because you need to be heard. And, uh, you know, if you have no light, it looks terrible. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, web, a too, webcam can work. So, yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's interesting, too, because the virus is really like there's a real supply and demand issue right now. So sometimes even just getting the the hardware for somebody at their house is not that easy. Right. I can't go out and buy a webcam right now. Or if I do, it's going to be like really bottom <laughs> of the barrel. Everything is sold out. And then you can sometimes get a microphone and it'll say like, OK, shipping in five to six weeks. And you're like, I need right. it now for my class. So there's a real supply issue where I think there's also... 
a demand. Yes, people are trying to do a lot from their house, but then I think your idea of like somebody being able to safely go in somewhere, produce something, and then walk away with with that artifact is really important. Yeah, there, I mean, there's so much to that I've been thinking about with with how this has changed. And as you say, you know, 2020 is going to be known as the as the the great web cra- webcam crisis. Um, <laughs> you know, where nobody could get a webcam and everybody needed to be online. Um, so it, you know, you, st- it, I think that stuff starts to get ridiculous really quickly. And and you you meet people where they are. Um, you know, mm-hmm. if all they have, you know, the other, the other thing is, is they forget that they have a cell phone in their pocket that has a camera in it that can do a good job with at least making the recordings, maybe not as easy to get online with that stuff. Um, but you know, it's a start and then you can build from there. Um, and then I think faculty then realize, Hey, you know what, even in normal times, if we ever get back to normal, we, I can incorporate this for quick videos that I need to, to push off to my students to say, here's a change in the syllabus, or here's something that I want you to think about, or here's a current events topic that, um, you know, we can discuss and then faculty and students can go from there with the various platforms. So yeah, we deal with Zoom. Um, we have a, a, a site, a campus site license. So it has kind of all the bells and whistles in terms of cloud recording and transcripts and, and that sort of thing. So that's really nice, especially in the days of <clears throat> where accessibility is being emphasized as well. So we want to make sure that we have a transcript to go along with with the video that we do. And, and then we have a transcription service for any videos that we produce in the studio or elsewhere. Um, so yeah, the Zoom technologies, um, you know, it, look, it, they've all got their issues and privacy and all that kind of stuff rears its ugly head. Um, but Zoom just, they they won because they made things easy and because they had decent quality. They weren't necessarily the best, but they certainly worked better than Skype. Um, and it was easy to use and people could pick it up fairly quickly in terms of how to use it. And then virtual backgrounds, like, you know, <laughs> yay, <laughs> ugly, terrible. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I kid about it because I look at them and I go, you know, I, I, I cringe, but everybody loves them because they can put themselves into this, this world where they want to be. You know, a lot right. of people uh, are putting themselves on the beach or in the woods. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. um, I'm, I'm enjoying that. I, you know, for me, a, a good bookshelf with some pictures in the background um, works very well. So you don't have to go, you know, too crazy with it. So, and it, it yeah. also, as far as StreamYard is concerned, you know, all, all these programs are kind of it taking off again. Um, you know, back in the day it was Wirecast and I think Wirecast is, is good. Um, but it's also not worth, it's not $500 worth good. Um, when you can do something like StreamYard, you know, monthly fee to get the features in StreamYard. Um, but you know, then you have things like OBS and then there's the OBS forks from, from there that do the different, different capabilities and putting themes and then it gets into streaming and video games, you know, recording, you know, all that stuff that, that COVID has really, uh, focused on. Um, and you know, we've got faculty that are, are doing a lot of different stuff, uh, with, with this technology and one in particular that I'll talk about, um, that's using Twitch. So. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because I was going to talk about video games because I actually like one of my theories is that that up until the virus and now the virus plays a role in it too. But I think video games and, and Twitch have really been pushing the entire industry of online broadcasting forward in amazing ways. I mean, you're seeing lots of new hardware coming out that we could talk about right. all of this various software. A lot of it's being right. driven by people who have monetized on it for their streaming. And a lot of that's come from Twitch and video game streams and things of that nature. And I think it's really incredible thinking back, you know, what we were playing around with back in 2012 and kind of trying to, you know, duct tape different solutions together. And <laughs> there, was, there was enough out there, but it was expensive. It was really geared towards like enterprise level. And now they're trying to bring the pricing down because they know they want people doing it from their living rooms. And the virus now I think has only pushed that forward 
forward even more so, you know, because now it's sort of like, okay, now everybody's a Twitch streamer in some sense, right? <laughs> like, you know, in that in that regard, we're all at our houses and we're all having to get online on meetings and things like that. So what does that look like? I think it's really interesting to see how that industry has pushed forward. And I love it because I have a, you know, an interest in it as, as you know, you all do, but I, I think it's really interesting. Well, it, it's been great to th to think about the stuff that we were doing in DuPont Hall at mm -hmm. the University of Mary Washington, um, yeah. and then, you know, moving into a bigger, more capable capable building and thinking it would be Nirvana, and then all the issues that we dealt with from there, ones that <laughs> almost killed me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and 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 probably in some ways kind of pushed me, you know, to to do something different, um, and and you know do it again in in a different way and in a way that i could kind of control and that's where i am 5 years later um and and like you say tim the 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 youtube streaming and the twitch streaming has just it it you know youtube has been on the scene for so long but because of covid it has just burst into you know, mm -hmm. domination um, and and YouTube as a as a platform for education in terms of um, just learning things about the streaming technology. Um, there's so many people that I that I have begun to follow that I wasn't even on. You know, they weren't on my radar at all. And now there's all these people that I follow on, you know, like and subscribe on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and, well, I think, and I'm I able think what to you're, yeah, <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, ring that bell. No, and what you're getting at, I think, too, is the progression of how people consume media, too, right? Like, I mean, right. that 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 march of progress was already going on, and now the the play field just continues to be leveled in that way, yeah. where you know, suddenly, you know, I'm a pinball fan, and I'm watching other people play pinball on Twitch and doing that kind of thing, and it's like or oh, marble watch, rallies. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, Fall Guys or <laughs> Minecraft or whatever the case may be. It's sort of like, oh yeah, I don't watch as much cable TV anymore. Oh yeah, we can't go to the movies because of the way things are right, right now. So the way we even consume media is driving everything forward towards this in, in just a huge way. It's almost like the Napster right. moment for big media, right? I've been a big fan of like these small, you know, video artist TV stations that are popping up. There's one called EXP TV that is just mind-blowingly awesome. And they have like a schedule. They have crazy, like, it's almost like the YOLO, the the, the Russian <laughs> YOLO, right? Remember that dude? <laughs> it's almost like that shit all day. And it's that's all it is. They find these crazy international and national and whatever video clips and they put them together and they have like music videos and it's just an experimental like MTV. Yeah. It let is it, amazing. Let, let a thousand public access television <laughs> plume in the wake exactly. of COVID. <laughs> right. Well, it reminds me too of, of SCTV, you yeah. know, where this stuff was brand new. Um, and you had Rick Moranis playing a character in the studio of, you know, the guy who, you know, hits the white button, you know, and that was, that was my, in the beginning there, that was my homage to Rick Moranis and bringing in the wipe, you know, that <laughs> right. reveals it's like that stuff was revolutionary back in the eighties. Um, and now it's not revolution, any uh, revolutionary anymore, but the average Joe can, or, or Jane, um, can can start their own YouTube channel and and be very successful with a minimal equipment investment. And then as they get more popular and they get more money, they reinvested in more equipment and so on. So yeah. um, it's been it's been fascinating to watch. I, you know the 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 ten the decade that has existed between March and and today um, <laughs> that it feels like um, the amount of stuff that has has changed and. Um, the, the way my thinking even has changed with the technology that's become available, um, the, the progression of stuff that's come along has been amazing to watch. And there's, there, so just to mention one of my, one of my favorite YouTubers is this guy, the Everyday Dad, um, and he starts out every YouTube you know video that he does with you know if I can learn how to do it, you can learn how to do it. Um, and it's you know it's it's goofy, it's campy, but. Um, it's also entertaining, and also there's a lot of great information that these people are able to put out there. So, yeah. 
Well, it's also interesting because you said this idea of going back to normal, and I don't think we are. And I think that's a, like what we thought of as normal, you know, pre-COVID and what we'll think yeah. of as normal, at least in our field, is not going to be. I don't think there will ever be. And I think this is here. And what we do with it and how we imagine it is important. So we thought of you immediately, which is why you're on. <laughs> and then we also did, we're thinking, I mean, to give you an insight into, you know, part of what it, we're thinking about turning the room Tim is in right now mm -hmm. into somewhat of a studio. And we know you have extensive experience both at UMW and now at UNF. And so we wanted to get a sense of what what's in your studio. Basically, and basically <laughs> free consulting in under the guise of, you know, big fan of everything that you're doing. What was the names of all of those <laughs> things? <laughs> no. Well, I, you know, I can I can, you know, shut everything down here and you know talk we need to talk before we go any further about compensation so yeah. if, if, if <laughs> well, i don't get the level that i need i'm just you're going to see color bars and that's it so well and, and there should be ndas i don't i don't know that we would want to actually be broadcasting this because then you can't resell that right. to other folks yeah, too. exactly right that's right so, <clears throat> i don't have a tone to go along with the bars yet so no exactly um, i actually i have a um a picture here of the studio. Uh, sorry to give you any flashbacks here, Andy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yep. here come the color bars. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's, no. he's out. He's out cold. Uh, Can I so, do that? No. Can I do that? No. Can we do this? No. <laughs> yep. This is my hundred thousand dollar studio. Stay out. <laughs> so this was the. Uh, for us, the IT Convergence Center, I guess now it's called the uh, Hurley Convergence Center. Um, right. But essentially, this was the um, production studio. And this was sort of a, a first crack coming from DuPont, where we were sort of duct taping solutions together, just grabbing random equipment on the fly. This was the first opportunity to say, like, let's actually design a studio. And you played a massive role, I think, in that. I'm curious to know a little bit about what this looked like and what you took from this in terms of ideas and methods and what you're doing now at UNF. Yeah, so, uh, and go ahead and leave this picture up for, for a second because there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff going on in that space. Um, and, a, and a lot of what happened in that studio, it, you know, informed where I am right now because so the thing that you see in the very foreground is a huge, like a 32 channel audio mixer, um, which I'm sure nobody ever got past four <laughs> um, in terms of needing audio for that space, uh, you know, maybe eight. Um, but it was it was really nice in terms of its integration. Um, and so a lot of this, this equipment I spec'd and Blackmagic Design is the company that, that it, it is still in existence and they do a lot of, I'm going to shift over a little bit here. So um, there we go. I can make it bigger um, over there. Yeah. No, it's it, no, this is, and this is a good shot right here. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the middle console there where the key, the keyboard and the mouse is, that's the ATEM switcher. So black magic design makes, makes these switchers called ATEMs. And I don't even know where they get ATEM from. Um, I, I, at one time I knew kind of the etymology of where that came from, but um, essentially it's their line of video switchers. And that particular one allowed, I think, eight different video inputs. Mm -hmm. So we had three, two or three studio cameras and you can see a boom microphone in the, in the green screen area. It was pretty tight in there. And, and one of the things that we quickly realized is we ordered lenses that were way off, you know, they were lenses that would work in a studio that was, you know, 20 by 20 or 30 by 30 or something like that. And we were in 10 by 10, I think, um, in terms of the working space. Um, and then there was really no audio treatment. So the, so the room really had this hollow sound to it. Um, and we thought about audio blankets and other, other treatments, but, you know, we've got a green screen cyclorama in that space that, um, you know, you really kind of want to immerse yourself. And then there's the racks of equipment that, that are on the far left-hand side there in the back <clears throat> with monitors. And, you know, a lot of that stuff I could get working. Um, the, the whole idea was that you had the camera and an operator being able to talk back to the studio 
you know, back and forth to get, you know, you know, get ready camera one. Okay. Switch camera, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think we ever had the, the, the people or the time to, to do a full on production like that. Um, it was, it was so new and, and we had to bang on the equipment just to get it working in a certain way. And I think, you know, I think we got there, but I think also at that point, things were going on at Mary Washington and I was so exhausted from, from the mental, you know, kind of hoops that I had to go through to, to do some of this stuff that I, I needed a break. So and it, and <laughs> I moved I, and to Florida. I think, well, and I think to your point, it's, it's sort of difficult trying to design a studio to, to think about what's possible, what we may want to do in the future. And then you find out. <laughs> Well, we're not actually doing that. So you you yeah. almost want to call it all a waste. But at the time, like I think that the the goals were noble anyway, right? It's sort of like, oh, we could do all of right. this stuff. We'll need this equipment to be able to do it. And then you find out, well, there's no real, you know, traction in in doing those kind of things. So there's no well, and what I found budget. is there's right. just oh, sorry. an equipment budget. There's right. no people budget. There's just an equipment budget. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um and you know, I, I'm happy to be the people and the the equipment, the person that the equipment goes to, <laughs> and I get to play with the toys. Um, but yeah, that's been that's that's been the issue. And unfortunately, it took something like and not that not that they wouldn't invest in this going forward. It just would have been slower. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the crisis that we've had, it's accelerated it. Um, it and it's over. You know, it's overwhelmed my thinking because I'm just, con I'm, you know, I'm going to sleep and dreaming about cameras and how they integrate and how, you know, what if I can't switch to one or the other, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when you think about it, you've got this space, this space, um, you don't really need that big an environment to, to do something high quality. You need good audio, you need good lighting, you need a decent camera. Um, and then the other thing that people need are, a way to get all that stuff onto the web to stream it. Sure. Um, and so a little $300 box that I have down to my left, um, you're right, um, is all you need to kind of switch multiple cameras and send it into something like StreamYard or send it over Zoom or over Skype or you know pick your, your streaming platform or communication platform uh, that you desire. So so I want to know about that box, but I just want to, I have one last question before we leave off of UMW's work there. Would you, <laughs> I mean, would you want a room like that at this moment? Like if you could, would you say, yes, give me that room at UNF? Obviously with the, with the modifications, but is that designated space? I would imagine UMW is pretty lucky right now to have it. Whether they get someone to run it or whether they right. have people to run it, you would imagine that's a that's kind of like some forethought on the part of you and the people who designed the room to have those designated studios like that. Yeah. So, like all instructional technologists, I think you know you you're tasked with so many different things. So it would it would need to be a space that was designed in such a way that that one person could handle it and that one person was dedicated to that space. And I I don't I I can't speak to to where Mary Washington is is right now, but I have a feeling just in higher education that um, whatever person is there is managing multiple spaces and not just one space. So that gets that gets really difficult. Um, it, it, I would if I were to do it I would say just that. I want to have a large enough space where I can have a a room that I can slice up if I need to. Like I I can go into a corner and do this, um, or I can go into the green sp screen space and do that. Or it can or we open everything up. We we pull the curtains back and it's a it's a complete 360 degree cyclorama green screen kind of thing. So it's, I, I think what you need to do is build a space that's flexible. Um, and then you have a, a space that some, someone can learn, but also the equipment that you use, you have to be able to translate that down to some extent to people who will be using it. Um, you've, you've got to have other people maybe on your team that don't know as much about video, but need to know the basics so that they can help people out if you're not there because things quickly fall apart if, 
if you're the only one with the keys to the studio. So um, you want to make sure that you use equipment that is good quality, but also is accessible, uh, you know, down the line to people who uh, have a chance of learning how to use it. You mentioned black magic. I'm not using any of that for this, but I did pick up one of the um, A10 minis um, last December mm -hmm. to start playing around with that. And I think that's a perfect example of a lot of power, but simplifying things, right? Like, you know, it's, it's four cameras, which is probably more than enough for most studios, unless they're doing right. major productions. It's HDMI inputs on the back. Right. You know, there's buttons to press and you you switch between yeah. them and then it goes out and into any device and becomes a webcam. And so like that little piece, as opposed to, well, now I need SDI, SDI cables. What the hell are SDI cables? And now I've got to convert right. those back to HDMI to get to the camera. Right. And how the hell do I do that? And every step of the way is a $300 adapter. And, and you suddenly realize this is more than I can handle. So I, I love that more devices are coming out that are kind of, you know, meant for... The consumer, the prosumer, I don't know what you would call that, that, that level of, of user, but, you know, much more simplified, but still really powerful, I think, for people who want to do this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, so the HM Mini is, is a revolution and, and, well, all right, let's not go too far. It's an evolution. <laughs> <laughs> because because obviously there were the yeah. HM studios that 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 were in existence. And just this, like you said, there were this recording were brought H to you by Black Magic. Black Magic yeah, I, for all of your this is not a sponsored needs. video, by the way. Um <laughs> no, it, and and they were already working on the A10 Mini before COVID really hit. I, obviously, I mean they couldn't have brought this product, you know, out that quickly, but it it has changed the the way people have brought their YouTube channels to the to the general public in terms of the capabilities. So that studio that we had at, Mar at Mary Washington, there were eight inputs, but you could only use six because the two in the middle were crossovers. So it was four SDI and four HDMI. And so the two in the middle, you could either choose HDMI or SDI. So it was like you could only have six total, which was fine. I mean, we still didn't need that in, in the studio that we had. Um, now it's all HDMI. And the the huge difference, and and no one would even <clears throat> think about this and writing this down as as part of the specs of the ATEM Mini, but the huge difference with the ATEM was it simply used those HDMI inputs and it made them kind of all seeing HDMI because with the old ATEMs you had to have a specific frame rate and and resolution. They had to they had to match. You had to pick one. And so you'd plug in one camera from a device and then you'd plug in like a computer and it wouldn't match and you'd have to troubleshoot or get it into the right resolution. The, the greatest thing about the A10 mini that no one would ever talk about or think about is that you just it just scales the video on its own. So you plug whatever in and it does its thing and boom, you've got 1080p 30 frames per second. So um, that's that in and of itself is great, but also Another brilliant thing that they built into the A10 Mini was a webcam out. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got a USB-C port in the back of the A10 Mini, and you run that to a computer, and it is recognized as a webcam. So those four cameras now, or up to four cameras that you have, all of a sudden become part of your production studio that runs into your laptop or whatever you've got to, you know, to connect to the internet, and you've got a, a broadcast studio that you're sending out over Zoom or over StreamYard, you know, whatever. We've talked about all the different ones. So, And I believe um, the newer it, ones, the A10 Mini Pro actually streams directly yep. from the device. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. So there's yeah. actually three A10 Minis now. There's the oh, A10 really? Mini, the basic one, which is 300 bucks. There's the A10 Mini Pro, which is 600 bucks. Um, I think it's 295 and 595 for the, the prices. But so the A10 Mini Pro has the, the USB kind of do, does double duty. So you can send webcam out of the USB-C, but you can also record to a, an, like an SSD or a flash drive um, directly out of it, which is, which is nice. But it also has an encoder built in. So you can send that stream simultaneously to YouTube or Facebook or... And and in some cases, if it's not supported, you kind of need to get into the to the back end stuff. And 
set up the RTMP stream, you know, all that kind of stuff. So like DS106 um, TV. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, right. whatever, you're saying, it, you're saying the, that the ATM Pro even acts as a streamer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Yep. So it doesn't even need to go directly into your computer. Like the streamer is there apart from any connection you have to a computer. Yeah. So there's, so there's devices out there that allow you to, to live stream. Um, there was one that we used, I think briefly at Mary Washington called the video. Um, and it was basically a box that you connected the ethernet to, and then you <clears> would say, where do you want to stream to? And I think the choices at the time were YouTube and I can't remember. Maybe Justin TV. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Ustream maybe or something. Yeah, yeah. Ustream. Ustream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably Ustream. That that makes sense. Um, and that and that and, was HDMI in on one side and Ethernet on the other. I think, if I recall correctly, it was just an embedded. Yeah. Device. So and I think there was a pass through. So you could send an HDMI and then it would pass through out to a monitor and then it would have an an Ethernet jack in it that you could send to and you set up the ips and all that kind of stuff to go onto your network and you would stream out from there um, now that's built into a atem or then atem mini pro mm -hmm. um, and it's again it's it it makes sense you know it's it's kind of brilliant and it's in its simplicity um, there is also the atem mini pro iso which allows you to record each of the inputs from the cameras um, because what you what you're doing is you're you're bringing in the inputs the four inputs and you're going out to either streaming or you're going out to like an hdmi recorder um, and when you record that live you're recording your switches so you know you may have switched too soon or switched too late that what the ISO does, it allows you to record all four of those streams and it gives you all four of those videos. And then what you do is you actually take that whole switching uh, edit decision list, if you will, and you import it into their, into Blackmagic's editing program called DaVinci Resolve. You export that edit decision list and then you can go in and you can kind of you know, slightly adjust the when you switch from one input to another. So you can actually go back, you know, you had the live stream go out to YouTube or whatever, but the finished product that you did um, in the studio with all the switching, you can change and modify some of those things to to make it look like it was perfect. And um, it does. So that's it, what the ISO does. All of those various switches before. So it's just exactly. making it's all modifications. You don't have to re-edit the entire thing all over again. Exactly. It's it's basically, you know, it's a it's a text file that remembers all the things that happened at a given time. And then you go right. and you you essentially edit that in DaVinci Resolve. And then you can also export it out to, to Final Cut, which is what I use. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the that's the idea of of where we're going. So right now I have the, the ATEM Mini, um, but we're going to have an ATEM Mini Pro ISO in the studio. The other thing that you can that you can do is once you've once you've got one or the other. Um, so we would have the, the A10 Mini Pro ISO as our as our main kind of switcher. But then you take the A10 Mini that we already have and you could run more cameras into that. So you could have essentially cameras going into that and then the ISO has other inputs like computers or um, iPads or whatever. Right. Um, and so you've got, you've got that many more cameras added to your, to your system. So there's a lot of people out there who are demonstrating here's the ATEM mini pro ISO and here's the ATEM mini and it runs in and you've got like seven inputs that you can use wow. at a, at a, you know, given instance. So. so can I, can I ask any, this is awesome by the way. And can I ask, was the device you were going to show us the device that Tim showed us? Yeah. Yeah. It's ATEM mini. You too. So, and I think I, I think way back in oh whenever God. it was that it was introduced, I think the people who got <laughs> who got really excited about um, the, this A10 Mini Pro, um, Tim. I know you tweeted about it. Um, who else? I'm trying to think now. Probably um, Martin Alcy. I think has talked a little bit yes, about it. That was it. Yeah, Martin. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's like, hey, look what Black Magic just released. Um, and you know, 
I immediately started salivating because yeah. um, it just I just started thinking of the possibilities of what you could do with this. And then for it, it is it, it is different thing. though with like between that side of things and all of the USB devices. And because it's like I've got a USB camera, a USB microphone, none of that works right. with the ATEM. So like yeah. so that's where it's kind of like okay, all of that gets thrown out and instead you're using a really nice camera with an HDMI output. You're using microphones that have eighth inch jacks or converted to eighth inch as opposed to anything USB for audio. Did, it, uh, did any of that change or is that still the case? Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting point. And I, I think there, are, there were so many problems with USB cameras to try to do a multi-production kind of, Just you know, have a multi-production environment because there's inevitably, you know, delays and latency that that you have to deal with, um, and so the basic, and then and then audio, you know, trying to incorporate the audio um, and and working with delays there. So it was it was never a good solution that had any kind of legs forward. Um, and you know, I I've I've cursed HDMI in the past just because of, you know, cables and cable lengths and that kind of thing. Um, but now that you can take HDMI and convert it to USB in, in different ways. So the basic way, and you probably, Tim, you probably heard of something like this device, but it's, it's called the cam link. Um, and it's a basic way to take a really good camera with HDMI and convert it into a webcam. So, and it could be a, you know, the cheap Canon Vixia for 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. Um, it's got an HDMI output and you run it into the cam link into the HDMI port, and then it's USB on the other end that you plug into your computer and you've got a webcam out of your camcorder. Um, <clears throat> and then what you can do with that camera is you can change the exposure and change some of the parameters to kind of give you a better input device. Um, and there's certainly something to be said for, you know, a Logitech C920 or, or a good, webcam that can that can output and you just it's just there and you use it um you know the built the built-in cameras and the apple computers are are just now changing to 1080p which is amazing to me um, i think the brand new imac is now a 1080p uh, webcam built into it. It's like, why has this taken so long? But anyway, so it's, it's just a matter of, <clears throat> you know, if you want to do the production, um, and, and not be tearing your hair out, you, you kind of need to do HDMI, but, um, it's not to say that you can't do it. And there's probably companies that are working on even those lower end versions to, to use multi webcam inputs. So, um, it's, a, you know, it's a fascinating space. And I think, my my thing will be translating it to faculty and to students. To, I mean, I mostly work with faculty, but you know, we have students working on projects with faculty. So we've got to convert the ideas of how to do a production with, in many cases, you know, low end equipment or equipment that needs a little push to to get it to do what you need it to do. So um, <clears throat> my the, the basic camera that I have that I use is the is a Panasonic GH5. It's a Lumix GX, GH5. Um, on the top of it, it has a little hot shoe audio mixer, and that's where I'm getting my audio from. And so then in the switcher, I just keep that audio as, as the constant audio source. So I don't have to worry about switching audio or worrying about other audio cables. But I'll want to get this space into a, into a, a place where we can do podcast recordings and then we'll have multiple microphones and we'll be able to do the video version of the podcast and that kind of thing. So yeah, that's where it gets complicated. Well, and you talked about how, you know, in a lot of cases, it's great if you have a really nice camera, but you can get away with a, a decent enough camera if your lighting and audio are good. And so right. I think that's probably <laughs> a good segue into talking about what does that look like for people? Like, I mean, am I buying, you know, cam lights? I mean, what am I, what am I hanging up here? Or is it like <laughs> one of those ring devices that looks like I'm like tweezing right. my eyebrows here or something, or, you know, what, what does it look like for someone to have good audio and lighting as a part of it? So are you ready for the big tour? Yeah, I, I'd love the tour. I'm, I'm taking, <laughs> I'm taking vigorous notes and I'm, you know, I'm keeping track of all of these brand names because I'm hoping they're going to sponsor us after the fact. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. When Black, Black Magic starts sending you devices, I expect to get half of what you get. So. <clears throat> Soda stream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get get busy with the fizzy. So 
What so what I'm going to do and before before I get to the studio itself, um, I will say you know in ta- in terms of what you need, I, I think there's a constant evolution because the what's changed is really reducing it down to the small eight by eight space of of a, a spare bedroom that a faculty member is using at home. So you don't want big, huge light boxes necessarily in in that space. You want something that, that's a little bit more manageable. You want something with a dimmer control or whatever on it. Um, but you you really are looking for for a, a simplified version of a of a full on studio. Um, again, I, I I I preach this. I I say this over and over again. You know. Lighting and audio are the things that you concentrate on. And people will always say, well, what about the camera? And it's like you can get by with a lot of different types of cameras. Um, it, it And, you know, the, the GH5 is with a lens is like a $2,000 camera. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can get by with something much less expensive and still have very good quality. So you don't have to spend that much. It has some features that, that we use, but whatever. So mm-hmm. having said that, I will, I will start to give you the tour. And, and if, I'm uh, going too crazy or, (laughs) uh, you know, going off on tangents, you know, bring me back down to earth, but I'll kind of show you what's going on with, with the setup that I have here. Um, So this is my basic green screen shot. Um, The the camera without the green screen looks like this. So this is me in the studio Um, and it's just trained on, on myself right here. Here I've got my laptop. I'm looking at you guys in in Streamyard. Right above that, I've got another monitor. It's actually a it's a, a Ninja an Atomos Ninja Five recorder. So it's got the output from the HDMI from the switcher going into that, and I could be recording this. I'm not at the moment, uh, but it records to a solid state drive, and so that's the kind of the prototype for the recordings that we want to do, and then that comes out, and it goes into another box, um, one that you guys kind of put me onto was the Hop Hog, uh, the PVR rocket. Mm. Um, it's that <laughs> one red button that the faculty member can hit to record to their flash drive, so that's, that's kind of the end. At the domains conference, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's the that's the end point for the faculty member where they can leave with their MP4 file um, that they may want to trim the beginning and ending off, but they've got something where they're leaving the studio with that. Um, and then from the from the hop hog, it just goes to another monitor that that is another pass through that I can see is just a bigger monitor, a bigger version of everything. Um, so. So camera one, camera two is this is this background that I have on the computer, and I'll turn the key off. Um, camera three is an iPad, and so this is just another input that a faculty member could could use, and so they can click on it and they can write with their Apple Pencil. Um, they can get rid of all that stuff. And then they can switch to their next slide. So we can in, we, you can we can incorporate an iPad into the uh, picture. And then I've just got my GoPro that is going to show you all the stuff in the space. Um, what I'm switching with. So there's the buttons on the ATEM, and so I'll show you. I'll show you. The, here's the ATEM Mini. Right. Um, and the and the difference between the A10 Mini and the Pro and the ISO is there's more buttons over on this side here that allow you to stream and record and control what the output is uh, out of the output device. Um, so this is again the the basic version. Um, but what I'm actually controlling things with is what's called the Stream Deck. And so from if a, I hit from Elgato, right? From Elgato, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so and this is using a piece of software on the Mac called Companion. And so what Companion does is it is it gives <clears throat> the instructions to switch the A10 Mini. So this is just going USB into the computer and then that's talking with the A10 Mini to, to do the switching. So what I can do, let me see, I'm gonna switch to, oops. 
Which it's pretty incredible. I just want to say because, like, you know, from the previous, you know, shots that you had, it looked like as if you were in like a, a really fancy studio, and someone might be handling all the <laughs> switching for right. you. And it's just a handful of fairly small devices that you're just able to manage right there, pretty much at a desktop, right? Right. Yeah. TV is fake, Tim. You, <laughs> you have to realize this. The stuff that we do, it's pay fake. no attention it's to the man all... behind the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So what? So I've got isolated in my in my picture in picture the <clears throat> the cam link so I can show you the button. So it's just I'm on camera one right now. Here's the the computer input. Here's the iPad, and then this is just a double up of the <clears throat> of the uh, GoPro input. Um, and right now there's the there's the hop hog, and I can hit my button and and start recording. Um, then I've got a media input and a media background. And I can also do what's called, and I meant to do this in the beginning. I take that Jackson off. <laughs> so. That is awesome. That's cool. Let's take this off. Hang on one second. And this is this is the pro The other thing that, the, that I haven't set up yet are macros. Um, our macros for the ATEM. So the other thing that Companion can do is you can record all of the button presses in uh, in the software control for the ATEM. Um, so I'm doing some of my switching from the software on the Mac itself. You're not seeing that screen, you're just seeing this UNF background, but I'll show you that stuff in a, in a second. Um, but you're you're able to run macros and all you do it's just like excel you record your steps and then you say stop recording and then you play that those steps back so you can go in and make the changes in the switcher and then that's a, a button that will exist in companion for you to play back at a later time i didn't get a chance to set those things up but um anyway that's that's kind of where that is so let's take our our downstream key off um so it, let's 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 back up and we'll go to the to the webcam and we'll take my key off here. So let me just give you a little backup. So I've got a, an umbrella soft light on the right and the left hand side. Um, you know, here's the Stream Deck and my iPad. Here's the um, I can zoom in and zoom out. <laughs> Do the little hyper effect here. Um, but that's the StreamYard stream. This is the um, the Ninja 5 recorder. And in the back, it's it's got an SSD on it that you that you record to. And then the the GH5 is in the back. Okay. And then I'll turn towards the green screen. I've got kind of wall washers on the green screen itself. We still have the network jacks and the <laughs> the electrical outlets that we need to paint green. Um, I just strategically sit in front of them so that you don't see them. And then up in the ceiling, we've got wall washers coming from the ce ceiling. So they're just they're just basic, you know, maybe 150 bucks a piece for the lights that are there. And then trying to get as even a green screen as we can. Um, <clears throat> and so, so that's you're not, the, even, you're not no. even using a curtain. You just, you, you just painted the walls nope. and then you're trying to light it in a way to get rid of as much of any seams as you can. Exactly, because we 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 found with the the fabric and that kind of thing, or even the the paper, if you can get it, there's you know you got to get your steam cleaner out, or your you know your steamer to get the wrinkles out, and then you just you're dealing with so many kind of um, you know shadows because of the folds in the green screen. We just decided to use this the chroma key paint from B and H Photo or whatever, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so. And we've got it kind of going along the wall, but we've never really used that other wall. <laughs> we just we've only done this straight on shot so far. But we're hoping to do maybe eventually the floor will will be incorporated in in the green screen stuff. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's the kind of studio. And if you want me to stop and answer a question about something specific, um, I'll show you one other piece of equipment that I'll use. Well, actually, a couple more. So back in here, there's a there's just a, a basic. Uh, Ethernet switch that's here that allows me to control the <clears throat> switcher through the camera or um, through the computer through the Mac. 
So mm -hmm. I've got it going into Ethernet. You need to specify the IP address of the ATEM, and you, you're able to communicate back and forth. So when I press buttons up on the switcher, I can switch from the iPad or the computer or back to the camera. I can do that in software on the Mac as well. And that's where you can do much more fancy stuff. And then there's this other thing called the decimator, which I will demonstrate next. Okay, so are you guys ready? I love the name. <laughs> I don't know. Ready. <clears throat> to be so I'm gonna switch just back to the camera. Um, and I'm gonna undo one little thing here. Let's just make sure I'm undoing the right thing. Uh -huh. And while you're doing that, Andy, you, um, what microphone are you using, just out of curiosity? Oh, right. I'm sorry. I, should, I was going to show you that, too. Um, it's, it's just a, um, it's a Sennheiser MKE 600. It's a boom mic. Um, I will. So it's overhead. Yeah. It's, That's it's okay. literally right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can, I can get back when I get the GoPro back on, but what I want to do is I want to switch to input four and I'll take off my key. Okay. And I'll be right back. <laughs> Please stand by. Please stand by. Can you see me? We can. TV. All right. So now all the stuff is backwards, I assume. It is. And you may Indeed. or may not be able to read what I wrote. Hmm. We can. But if I switch... Red rum. Red rum. Red rum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so what I need to do, and I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna switch back to a mirrored display for my computer. And what I'm gonna bring up next is the decimator software. <clears throat> so see, if you see this little box right here, it's it may be pretty small on, this, on the screen, but um, it says horizontal flip enable. So I call this the $300 checkbox <laughs> because the, dec the decimator costs $300, but what it does is it allows me to the flip filter. that image. Yeah. Okay. So if I go back, you'll you'll be able to see me right way around. And is that that's a glass whiteboard or something? Yeah. So it's it's what it's what's called a light board. And a light board. Okay. So we just have I have another another camera that's trained on this, and there's actually an LED light all around it, so that's what kind of illuminates me. We mm -hmm. may have other lights on on the side, but then you're just able to to write on it and do you know equations, you know. And it, it looks like I'm able to write, you know, backwards. Um, <laughs> and it's, a simple, it's just a simple switch that allows you to to see what's going on and, and we'd be able to record this live for a faculty member. And then we could even bring in overlays from the switcher and that and that kind of thing. That's pretty you probably cool. can't even hear me talking barely, have can you? No, it was clear. You and, can hear it? Okay, good. And I saw someone, a professor that was linked out, I think by Clint Lalonde or someone about um, a woman at USC who had been experimenting with OBS and doing some of that light board stuff, which I thought was really cool. So that's uh, that's super cool to see you doing that. Yeah, I've been I've been amazed when when they first let me bring my key back up. Um, when, when people first started talking about, uh, the light board and incorporating it and, uh, spending the money on it, I, I wasn't very excited. And that's, that's how the technology is. Sometimes, um, you, you think about it and you think, well, what would I ever use that for? Or would our faculty, you know, take to that? I've gotten more interest in the light board probably than, than other stuff in the studio. And then, you know, in some cases that's personally disappointing, but um, <laughs> it's exciting, you know, it's ah, exciting for, right. for faculty to be excited about making stuff and doing stuff in, in a space. So. Um, well, and I imagine <clears throat> it, it 
it really depends on, you know, what they're teaching, right? For a math professor, it's probably crucial that they're able to actually write out those equations and things versus someone teaching art. Yeah, probably not. They're probably more excited about being able to pull up images on an iPad and do <laughs> things like that and switch back and forth and that kind of thing. So I think a lot of it depends on the discipline. Yeah, it's the kind of thing, I'm gonna bring back my, my UNF logo here. Um, <clears throat> The, the big thing about uh, this era that we're in is the connection part gets lost. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you aren't able to see people face to face. And I don't know if, I assume you've, you've experienced this and I know faculty <clears throat> and students have also experienced it, is Zoom room exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Like when you're done with the Zoom conference, it's exhausting. And one of the reasons that it's exhausting is that we're not face to face and we're not able to, to look at each other. And even the audio is, is not clear. You know, there's breakup in the audio or there's times when you don't quite <clears throat> hear somebody, you know, the first time and you have to ask them again, or, you know, is your, <laughs> my, mu my, my mic is muted, uh, you know, you might want to turn your mic on, you know, all that kind of stuff that goes on during the Zoom meetings. Or people are um, looking at their camera, they're not looking at you and vice versa. So there's never that right. and I'm, connection. I mean, I'm even in that situation right now um, where I'm not always looking into the barrel of the lens um, right. and that that makes a difference. I know um, so that. that 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 eye contact is really important. And so one of the things that I'm also going to be incorporating of all technologies that I don't necessarily use a, a whole lot and I don't necessarily encourage it a lot, um, <clears throat> is a teleprompter. Yeah. yeah. You know, a teleprompter to read your script is, is what, you know, fa faculty just say, well, I've got a script, you can just put it on a teleprompter and I'll read that. Well, I say, well, you need to practice that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But aside from that functionality of a teleprompter, what a teleprompter also can do is it can take the output of a video feed. Yeah. Um, and you can put it, instead of the text that you would read on a teleprompter, you can be having the video feed up at the same level of the lens. And so you're literally looking at the person on the other end of the Zoom call. You're looking into the lens at the same time. So all we need to do is just kind of, and what I'll use is an iPad that will now take the output from the Mac um, and it will put it there. And there's a, there's a program out there that will actually uh, has what's called teleprompter mode so that you can take your zoom call and you can switch it right way around so that you can see them and, and everything is, is facing the right direction. And then you're just looking at your camera lens, but you're actually seeing the person that you're talking to and you've got eye contact. So is that like um, the Interacam that Errol Morris would use? Exa would exactly. That's exactly, I mean, it, it's the, the Interacam is much more sophisticated and you know, there's, there's mirrors and, and lights and, and stuff that's internal to that. That's much more complex. Um, but yeah, it's essentially the same thing. If you can get a, a video camera trained on somebody, you know, straight on, um, they now that's smart. the people on the other end won't be able to see you the way that you see them. So I'd be looking at somebody, a zoom feed, I'd be seeing them and I'd be looking straight into the camera that it, it, they'd have to have the same setup on the other end in order for them to see me the same way. Yeah, I found myself doing that a lot here in the office where if I've got a TV and I'll I'll typically put the mic the um the webcam on a boom stand so that I can put the webcam right in front of the TV as opposed to above or below it just so that right. you know it covers a little bit of the actual, you know, what yeah. you're seeing, but not enough to where it makes a huge difference. But then being able to look directly at the Zoom call or wherever we're at and be able to look and you're looking in the camera, but seeing the people as well. And I, I do think it does make a big difference. It's it's almost subconscious, but it makes a difference, right? It does. Exactly. Yeah. Th so there's so so the Mac does sidecar, which allows you to send a screen to the iPad or an okay. iOS device, essentially. Then mm -hmm. there's a piece of software called Duet. Um, and I found a program online, uh, like a like one of these little Mac programs that allow you to do these strange functionalities in your computer um, <clears throat> that, would, that would horizontally flip it with software. But it gets a little bit wonky. But now I think there's a, a program called Luna something. Um, 
if you know Adam Lizagor, he just did a video on it. Um, he's the guy that sells every anything and everything, um, you know, online. You know, kind of these two Web 2.0 kind of companies. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it's added this teleprompter mode so that you can switch your iPad or your iOS device as something that that gives you that you know looking. So I so my my view here is the monitor. So when I'm looking straight here at my monitor of who's on camera. My camera is just a little bit up and that's, you know, the lens yeah. is there. So it's close, but it's not, you know, it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and it just gives you this look of like, you're looking down at your notes or you're looking down at your computer. So even if you um, were just you looking know, at yourself, I think there's a lot of value in that. You're monitoring what you're recording. If a faculty yeah. member is recording themselves doing things, they want to know that, you know, if you still want to keep looking at the camera, but no, okay, I actually did switch to my notes properly. And I, you know, like they're seeing what I, they're supposed to be seeing, you know, without right. having to look away or suddenly look down and go, oh, I forgot to hit the button to switch it, you know? So it allows that real time exactly. monitoring. Too. Yeah. Exactly. I like that. I like that. Um, what is it? Corsair? Is that the people who make Elgato? I like that switcher that you have right there that's connected mm -hmm. to the uh, stream deck. Yeah. Stream the stream deck. deck yeah. 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 That's slick. Um, let me switch. Let me switch cameras. If I'm again. right, the stream deck is connected not only to your computer, well, is connected to your computer, which then is connected to the ATEM Pro or the ATEM regular which is where you can um, have all those inputs plugged in, cameras. Are the mics going into the A10 Pro too? So the microphone, and, and here I can show you the, the microphone now. Um, it's just, this is just the boom arm with the Sennheiser microphone. Got it. And it's just, it's right above my head. <laughs> Let's make sure I've got my chair oriented here. Um, <clears throat> so, so the stream deck, let me take my key off here. The stream deck just goes USB into the computer and it's running, the software that's controlling it is called Companion. So if you, if you just do a search for Companion, it's a, it's a piece of software that, <clears throat> that gives you, and I'm gonna hide these other ones for right now. And you can tell the buttons to do anything, right? Like I, I think you could press a button and play an audio file or whatever the case may be. It's just a grid of things. Yeah. So normally, normally the the there's Stream Deck software that goes um, and controls. Like you can start programs, you can play sounds, you can you can build macros and that kind of thing to do things on your computer. Mm -hmm. what what the companion software is, which is separate from the Elgato Stream Deck software, and they can't run simultaneously or they get confused. So what companion is, it's, is it's you, you literally configure the buttons um, to match what's on the Stream Deck. So everything that you see here is, is the way that it looks on the Stream Deck. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, that Stream Deck or that's that's companion on the stream deck and this is the interface and then you can go and you can configure all of these and you can there's even presets so if you go into the atem presets that are there you can come in you can bring any of these you know onto your uh your companion and and build your studio essentially you know right. or your switcher in terms of giving it extra capabilities so it's it's pretty i mean the innovation that has happened in that space um is pretty con con incredible there's another piece of software that i've been made aware of called h2r graphics and there's and that's another thing <clears throat> so the so the atem um switcher crowd there's a couple of guys there's one guy named aaron parecki who um is who does these live streams using the software and he just basically holds question and answer sessions for you know an hour or so about how to do things in the ATEM world, you know, in the switcher world. And so one of them is, and then there's another guy named John Barker who has a, has a uh, YouTube channel called here to record. Um, fun and fact, he built fun this fact about Aaron is Aaron is actually a huge guy in the indie web. Community yeah, as and well. the, he does OAuth stuff, right? I was thinking that. Yeah, yeah. yeah we met him guy. when we were at MIT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's you know in his spare time, he he has a <laughs> studio kind of show that he that he shows off, 
cameras and switchers and how all the different ways that he kind of incorporates graphics and and things into things it, it, you know into his his stream and Aaron or I'm sorry John Barker at here to record built this software that allows you to do like lower thirds that will go over and you've got to you've got to do a little bit of setup to switch what your input is so I won't make this work right right at the moment but you can you know do things like lower thirds tickers timers um, that that kind of thing within the switcher environment. So there are just there's so many people that are kind of innovating in that space that it's it's just it's a cornucopia of you know stuff that's available to kind of do um, in the do-it-yourself studio world. Um, it's just it's really kind of amazing. Um, so. I, that's that's kind of the demo of the studio, and that's that's where my headspace is right now. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them as long as you've got them. Um, it's super I know cool. I don't... Like I said, I think it's it's really cool to see that you're doing that, not with some like huge fancy production studio. I mean, you literally you painted a wall, you bought a little bit of hardware, and you're sitting at a desk and doing it, and it looks really nice. And I think that's really inspiring you know, for me, as well as I think for anybody else that would be watching this to know, okay, like, you know, it's, it's clearly not something that most people would do in their living room. But at the same time, if people are thinking about like, what's the next step, especially if you're in the ed tech scene, and you're thinking, man, it'd be really great for us to have something a little bit nicer here in the office, we've got a spare room or something like that. What can we do and get away with? I, I think you're right. I think the the hardware and, and just the costs overall have, have dropped and things have become a lot more user friendly in that regard in terms of compatibility, things playing well together in terms of just access to stuff that players like black magic has already been around. Elgato has been around for a while now, but doing a lot more in the way of capturing and providing those devices like the stream deck. And so I think it's, it's all super cool stuff. And I appreciate you jumping on a call with us this morning to talk about it. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's been great. I mean, so it, where we go from here, um, I've got more equipment on order. Um, mm -hmm. and the, the, what I showed you is, you know, for some people, they would look at it and it's just kind of a jumbled mess of, of wires and boxes and things that, that do stuff that, um, they can't begin to fathom how it's all working together. Um, so that the idea for the next step is just to kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, industrialize it, streamline it, um, yeah. so that we've got a rack of equipment that it, they that faculty can ignore, but they know it's doing something. But the the mess of wires and cables are out of the way, and so we'll have a a a phase two of this studio that will have some of the basic capabilities, but it'll have like the rack mountable SSD recorders from Blackmagic. Mm -hmm. It'll have a Blackmagic camera that actually will have, and, and we'll be able to communicate with the ATM, ATEM switcher to do things like zoom and focus, um, and also have like a tally light so that you know that that camera is on. Um, mm -hmm. so, so simple additions like that with, with some, a little bit more expensive equipment will give the studio and ease of use that will be, you know, much more at the forefront. Right now, I wouldn't say it's very easy to use. I can probably teach my colleagues how to use it in terms of, you know, the team that I work on, but faculty, that would be a, a, a tough sell. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but then, you know, we can kind of see where we go from there. But the idea is that from here, I can make little videos that show people how to make a mini studio. So, so one of my future videos will be, okay, you've got two of the little R, uh, the two of the Canon camcorders and a switcher and a microphone, you know, wireless microphone. How do you put that into a space that a department or a school can use at the university? Um, here's how you use it. Here's what, here's what you need to consider. Don't forget your lighting. Um, use this good microphone, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, I'm always kind of thinking about, you know, what, what can you do with this and how do you make it accessible? So. Andy, one question for you. Um, yep. With the phase one studio you have set up right now, um, mm -hmm. if you exclude the cost of the iMac and you exclude the cost of the iPad and some of the hardware that let's just assume someone has, what would be the cost for the phase one with like a $2,000 camera, like you said, the GH5 or whatever, what would be the cost? Like lights, switchers, 
all of that stuff, roughly. It doesn't have to be exact. It's just an estimate. So I will just think off the top of my head of the of the things that you would need. So I so what you need a good set of lights and you need a good microphone. Again, emphasizing the two things that I always start with. I would recommend something like a Rode Wireless Go, which sells for about two hundred dollars, and that's a, a wireless microphone that you can click on, clip on the camera, and plug in, um, and then you wear it uh, as a lapel. And then there's also a wired a wired microphone that you can attach to the to the module, the the transceiver module that that goes to the to the camera. Um, so that's 200 bucks plus the lavalier is another 80 bucks. So, so for about, for less than $300, that's your microphone. Um, <clears throat> you then get a pair of lights. So a light on the a left and the right, and you can get these. So Elgato makes a, a set called the key light, but they're on the expensive side. So you can kind of get a, a knockoff of the Elgato key light for about 80 bucks a piece. So 160 for lights. The, uh, you don't have to have a stream deck. It's something that I use that gives you that extra capability, but the stream deck is about $130, I think. Um, and the hop hog, uh, recorder is around that same price point, maybe a little bit less. Um, and then the black magic design, uh, the ATEM mini, the, the basic version is $300. So somebody do the quick math for me, um, and total that all up. Um, that's basically what you need. And then, so you, you mentioned a camera. I've got the GH5. I would say that's a higher end camera. The black magic camera that we're going to be getting is about the same price point around the $1,300 price point without any lenses. Um, and you generally want some good lenses. So you can actually buy a, a baby brother to the GH5, which is the, the Panasonic G7. And just the body for that is about 500 bucks. So you can wow. get it. And that's with a kit lens. So like a 14 to, to 45 lens, which you, you double those focal lengths and that's the focal lengths that you're working with. Yeah, so it's like a particular so like a 28 to 80 lens. I'm sorry. I was going to say, are those lenses particular to the camera that you buy? It's not like you, you can take a Canon lens and put it on a Panasonic camera or whatever the case may be, or are they interchangeable right. at all? Or you can yeah, so, whatever brand you go with. So micro four thirds is the, is the format of the lens. Um, or the the style of the camera and the mount. So the lenses that would work on the GH5 would also work on the G7 and also any other micro four thirds camera um, gotcha. that, that has interchangeable lenses. So the mm -hmm. Canon mounts are different. So Canon lenses need to be Canon mounts. Nikon lenses need to be Nikon mounts. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, it's funny. It used to be Canon and Nikon were the cameras for for digital photography. And then as they move forward into video, um, <clears throat> Nikon kept up for a while, but they, uh, they're they kind of off in the distance and Canon is the real innovator right now. Um, but I like the, the Panasonic cameras because of a lot of different little issues that just make it easier to work with. For instance, it's got a basic standard size HDMI output instead of the mini or the micro. So that's you know one of the reasons that I use that. Um, <clears throat> And then, you know, obviously with the black man magic integration, that's something, you know, that, that does a whole lot of different things. And you can actually re record internally to that, to like an SSD. There are lots of other capabilities. So it's, it's really kind of, you know, here's your basic setup, here's your intermediate setup, here's your advanced setup. And so there's the different price points. So probably, you know, a thousand bucks gets you a studio, again, not including the Mac or the computer that you're using to do uh, the interfacing with, but um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing what is, is out there and, and there's going to continually be innovations and I'm sure eventually black magic will update their current line of rack mountable ATEM switchers to have all those capabilities that people are looking for, like the webcam out, um, mm -hmm. and, and some of the capabilities, the recorders built in and the, uh, encoders built into them. So, um, it's a it's a golden time to be doing what I'm doing. And then, you know, if, if I could pick two things in higher education to to be concentrating on over the last 10 years, it would be web development and and video production. And I'm I get to do both of those here at, at UNF. Um, and so the the web development stuff is the platform where you put the media. Um, so I just I'm in a. 
I'm in a world of of wonder here uh, at UNF. Well, that's well, super. It's, yeah. it's always warming to see you, Andy, but to see you thriving like this and actually, you know, your day comes when you know it's it is awesome, and you have so much knowledge in this space. So. I thank you for like spending it, but we'll be calling you again and bringing you on for another reclaim today as we build ours. And the idea of a thousand dollar price point is amazing. It's amazing if you're building a studio as an ed tech group or in your house, if you can afford it, like that's a number that's not the hundred thousand, the 50,000, the 20,000 we were used to. Um, right. It's really encouraging. So thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was the ATEM itself was a thousand dollars back in the day, and now yeah. you've got it a third of the cost as mm -hmm. your starting point to do a switcher in a studio. So, yeah, it's it is it's a great time, and I'm you know I hope to have a dueling studio set up with you guys and see who can do it better, um, and have that competition because that always what was the thing that drove us to be to be better. I'm only half kidding. You know, it, it really is yeah. the, the kind of idea of, Hey, did you see this? And then sharing that with your colleagues uh, directly, um, you know, doing it even in this environment with the, with the three up boxes, you know, um, sharing what we, what our knowledge is and where we're going forward with it. Uh, and, um, you know, maybe eventually the sponsorships will come. The right. Interacam cam thing is brilliant. That's yeah, we that, I'm taking that one. We don't need a dedicated T1 line to simulcast between the two studios or anything. We've got the internet, so. <laughs> Funny that you mentioned that. There yeah. is there is another device from ATEM called the, oh, I'm blanking on it. Um, mm. There's a, it's a, it's a, it's a box that allows you to communicate um, over ethernet to like another building or through the internet to another remote location. So um, that stuff is, is coming at a low price point too. Yeah. Yeah, bandwidth is always important. Well, Andy, anytime you get your channel up, I think you've definitely got two subscribers in me and Jim. So <laughs> smash that like button. We will for sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on this morning. We really appreciate it. And I know this it is was great seeing you both. You too, going Andy. back and scribbling notes down and taking taking note of everything. But I love it all. Thank you. Thanks. Andy. Absolutely. So glad and, and look forward to the future one. Awesome. Thanks. Take it easy. See ya. Bye. Bye.